Hello, and welcome to this pre-recorded webinar. Today, we're going to talk about the power of partnerships for both water and wastewater systems. And there will be a follow-up live question and answer session on September 28th. I'll share the information for that at the end of this um, webinar, and it's also available online, same location where you found this webinar itself. All right, so to get started, we are going to, um, I'm just going to give you here an overview of the plan. So we'll do a little bit of housekeeping and introduction, um, talk a little bit about sector-wide challenges, understanding how your utility is doing, and delve into different types of partnerships, including consolidation. And we'll go through some examples of consolidation and then talk about steps for what partnering might look like, including thinking about financial benchmarking and asset management. So just um, as a little bit of housekeeping here, um, this course has not been submitted for pre-approval of continuing education credits, but um, if you are eligible to um, receive them through your own institutions, we are happy to send you a certificate of attendance for your record. Um, you need to watch the entire session um, and it has to be a unique individual. You can't have, get a group credit. Um, if you are interested in that certificate, go ahead and send us an email, smallsystems at syr.edu, and we'll send it to you within 30 days. Uh, and just a little bit of background. So uh, my name's Alicia East Hope Fraser. I'm project director with the Environmental Finance Center at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And we are one of many environmental finance centers that are part of a larger environmental finance center network. And you can see here, there's a number of other folks that are part of that network, um, and we all work collaboratively together. So if our EFC can't help you, another one might, might be able to, and we can put you in touch. And the EFCN, the network itself, is a university-based organization, and our goal is to create innovative solutions to the difficult how-to-pay issues of both environmental protection and water and wastewater infrastructure. We work both collectively and individually to address these issues across the entire United States, including territories and, um, and some tribal areas as well. And we aim to assist public and private sector through training, direct professional assistance, production of durable resources and other innovative policy ideas. And some of the areas of expertise of the EFCN, you can see here, um, asset management, we'll actually talk a little bit about that today, energy, water loss reduction, conservation, um, leadership. So there's lots of different areas of expertise here at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, we tend to focus on these, the right setting and fiscal planning, collaborating with other systems, so partnerships, um, and accessing infrastructure financing programs. That's one of our big areas. So if you have needs in these areas, we might be a good resource for you. And the other thing too with our EFC is we do also conduct applied research. Um, we do some program design and evaluation. We also do some teaching and outreach, advising, policy analysis. So there's um, other opportunities for us here. And just a standard disclaimer here, we are funded by the EPA, um, but the, this material doesn't necessarily reflect views and, and policies of the EPA. All right, so let's get into the heart of why you are here. Um, this sector is hard. Water and wastewater is really hard. Um, the, you know, the infrastructure that most utilities have in place at the moment is aging and failing. And in 2021, the American Society of Civil Engineers gave the nation's water infrastructure a C minus grade and the wastewater infrastructure a D plus grade. So we know that this is an issue for most of you probably, many of you are probably here because of that very thing. And we know that significant funding is needed. So in 2019, the total capital spending on water infrastructure at all levels was approximately 48 billion, while capital investment needs were 129 billion. So there's an $81 billion gap between what people are needing and requesting for funds and what's actually available and being awarded. The other thing is affordability is a growing concern, right? Many of us are really trying to strike that balance between revenue and affordability. And a 2022 study, um, in this study, 
10% of households face water affordability concerns, which they define as expenditures on essential water and sewer services greater than 4.5% of annual household income. And households in the lowest income decile, you can see here the under 15,000, that top line in the table, um, you can see those folks are paying 6.8% on average of their annual income on water and, sand and sewer service. And we already know that water rates are outpacing the consumer price index. So this is a real challenge for most utilities. Another component is that water and wastewater systems are very diffuse and fragmented utilities and, and systems. There are 153,000 public drinking water systems and more than 16,000 publicly owned wastewater treatment systems across the country. And unfortunately, wastewater systems are functioning on average at 81% of their design capacities. And you can see this graphic here in the state of North Carolina, nearly 1,800 systems serve only 10% of North Carolina's population. So you have a really vast network of these systems that's really only, you know, providing a small portion of the population with infrastructure. The other piece is that there's complexity and change in the sector, right? You think about there's new policies, regulations, and there's some adaptation that's required. Think about PFAS and PFOA monitoring and what that looks like in that treatment, right? That's one example of how the sector is changing and new laws that are being put into place. So we like to think about, you know, describing these challenges through a kind of more scenario. And so you think about town A and town B, both of these towns have the exact same size wastewater treatment plant, the same number of linear feet, same number of employees. But town A is serving a large geographic area. It's a very rural system. And town B is serving a small geographic area, very urban system. And so the the actual infrastructure is the same in terms of number of linear feet, right? Number of employees. And so the cost of maintaining the systems is equivalent in total, but the cost to customers varies because of you've got a smaller population spread across a larger geographic area. They're bearing weight um, a little bit differently than the number of customers across the small geographic area. Right, you think about pipe repairs, employee time to check meters, or build in new connections, right? Those are really gonna vary quite a bit from town A to town B. As well, financial resiliency. And the, you know, so if we think about town A as having 80% residential, small, you know, residential customers and 20% um, small customer, commercial customers versus town B with 60% residential, and then they've got some other large industrial customers, there's a big difference in that makeup and potentially in that revenue, depending on how they structure their rates. And so if the, you know, if town B were to lose an industrial customer, although it might be unlikely, it could dramatically shift their, res their revenue and the rates for their remaining customers. Versus if, you know, there's more of a spread of types of residential and commercial users, Maybe you'd see less of a revenue loss shock if you lost a few customers. So there really can be differences in these types of systems based on a number of different factors. So what we'd like to spend some time doing with a utility, and I'm, I encourage you to do this, is doing a holistic check-in. What is the overall health of your system? Are you self-sufficient? What is your level of service? Are you having any issues with pressure, color, smell, taste? Um, are you able to maintain your infrastructure properly, operate properly? Are you making investments in your infrastructure to try to ward off depreciation and, and change over time? And the ability to look at that overall health of your system really does provide you know, quality service now and into the future to be able to do that. And we like to compare this holistic check-in to going to the doctor. So we like to look at multiple factors, just like if you're going to a doctor's appointment, and it's not just one number or one occasion, um, but it's, a really, it's really more about a viability check to be able to flag issues and look at challenges over time. So you think about if a patient has high blood pressure, maybe medication is sufficient to help prevent a heart attack. But if that patient has high blood pressure, cons consumes a lot of food and high in sodium, and doesn't exercise much, they've got a sedentary lifestyle, then those risk factors make the high blood pressure more dangerous, and maybe they need to mitigate the situation in another way. But then what if that patient 
with the high blood pressure comes in and they have a broken arm, well, the treatment needs at that appointment and the options are gonna be very different. So then we like to think about that in terms of utility. So what are some of the different categories of, you know, of those, those different facets that we need to evaluate a utility? We think about the financial, managerial, service population, infrastructure, technical, location, right? There's a lot of different metrics here. You think about your different expenses, your staffing, economies of scale, or do you have violations, right? There's a whole kind of list of different types of um, metrics that you can use to look at your system. And they all interact with each other too. So it's it's more, you know, it's it's more complex and less straightforward than just some numbers. So I've got one example of an actual utility. Um, and and we'll kind of take a look and see what they, you know, what was happening with them and kind of thinking about this holistic check-in. So you can see here over time, this was 2002 to 2016, so quite a range here, but they're seeing the number of their customers slowly decline. It's pretty gradual. Um, you know, could be fixed if that was the only problem, but it's but that's what they're seeing is that kind of decline in customers. What they're also seeing is actually the volume of their water bill is decreasing, which again, not unexpected. Um, this, there's a lot of efforts for conservation. Um, if people are getting older, which we'll see, maybe they're using less water rather than if they've got a family. Anyway, so we're seeing over time that their you, their bills are declining, which great, it's great for conservation and for water, but not great for revenue. And then we can see here, this is their, um, their area. And you can see we've got relatively low populations. There's kind of one center here, um, around 20,000, one, one community. But the rest of them are very small, ranging from you know, 400 to 5,000 folks. So their, their communities are small. Um, and therefore, maybe the number of potential customers is dwindling. We also have an aging population. So you can look and see, I realize this is a little bit small, but you can see the, the darker, the color, the more elderly the population is. And a lot of these small communities are starting to get older, which means fixed income, maybe less economic activity. So it can really change the demographics of your community. And then there's also a real issue of poverty and, and affordability in this area. So you can see, that this is the percent of households with income less than 15,000, which we're kind of have, you know, including as that lowest bracket. Um, and you can see there are several communities in that dark blue that have more than a third of their population with income at that level. Um, and so we're really seeing affordability being a major issue for a lot of these small communities. So could they even afford a higher rate structure if you tried to implement that, right? So there's a lot of different pieces that we're seeing built up for this utility that's signaling to them or should be signaling signaling to them that they might have some challenges ahead. And you know, these different factors can lead to a distressed utility in many ways and at different time scales. Um, and they might have different outcomes as well. So we, we like to think about this as a balance. So maybe this community that I'm talking about, this area, you know, they've had all these pieces and now all of a sudden they've got a big industrial customer that is leaving, right? Which is maybe a more sudden event as compared to a pop population decline. But both of them are gonna set the background for revenue decline, right? Which makes it harder to get a utility back into balance. And then maybe they're having some issues with leaky pipes. They're harder to fix. They become more of a public health hazard. The utility is now experiencing several long-term stressors after the loss of that industry. And then a natural disaster happens. There's a big flood. And it's clear that there are too many major challenges to get them back to viability. And the time scale of events is important to note as well. In this case, the industry leaving and the flood were relatively quick events, but the background of lower revenue, infrastructure that wasn't being rehabilitated, and the declining service population really contributed to making it difficult to recover from those short immediate events. So then let's say we compare this with another utility, you know, different area maybe, that was maybe proactive about raising their rates to compensate for the loss of industry and some customers, um, you know, and maybe the service population was able to afford higher rates. So they're, they're really working on that revenue. 
And then maybe they had some staff who were knowledgeable and proactive about rehabilitating infrastructure. So the leaky pipes didn't result in high risk to public health and the facilities were operated and well-maintained. Well, that utility might be doing well right now and they might be able to maintain viability into the future. But what if that utility needed a well and kept drilling but not finding a good one? Maybe that would be that would tip the balance in the other direction. So as you can see, there's a lot of what ifs. They can kind of go on and on. And these factors aren't isolated either. So then we like to think about, like I mentioned, those other metrics before. So thinking about them kind of holistically, um, you know, what's available. So we have, you know, we need to take a look at that financial location, managerial, technical, service population, which is what we think about as what encompasses a viable utility. But maybe some of those factors aren't available to your population. So you might have to look elsewhere, right? Maybe, you know, that that patient who comes in with a high blood pressure, you know, their treatment options depend on the greatest needs at the moment and the medical history, right? So we have to think about where is your utility and what are the options? What is available, right? So maybe comparing these two utilities for this one that did have the wherewithal to plan ahead or the ability to, right, to bring in that revenue, maybe they just need to replace some of their infrastructure with a low interest state revolving fund loan, you know, and maybe they'll be viable going into the future. But for others, like this, you know, the first example, one loan isn't going to be enough to bring that utility back to viability, even if it's one loan now to fix one piece and in three years, another loan to fix another piece long term, it's not going to be sustainable if they've got a declining customer base. So then we like to think about, well, what are some of their other options? So I'm going to go back to this viable utility chart to think about the TMF framework. So TMF stands for technical, managerial, financial. And we think about it as a way to summarize the different capacities that are necessary to run a utility. And so having the strong technical managerial financial capacity really enables a system to have the capability to consistently provide safe drinking water to the public or clean water into the environment. And partnerships can really help oops, partnerships can really help a system improve in any or potentially all of these areas. So what do what do they mean? So when we think about technical capacity, um, so we think about the source water or collection system adequacy, adequacy, right? So the infrastructure itself, um, how is your water, wastewater tr treatment? How's the distribution? How's the storage? How's your discharge, right? It's that technical knowledge, the implementation way that we can be te you know, technically sound um, and educated in our systems. This is the you know, physical nuts and bolts and the intellectual capacity that goes with those nuts and bolts. If you've got an operator who doesn't understand the system very well and can't maybe suggest you know, more um, efficient ways to operate, that sort of thing, it can be harder for the system to make those changes. It can also help, um, really affect violations, right? So if somebody's not knowledgeable about something or the piece, you know, the nuts and bolts aren't there, a system might be more vulnerable to violations and therefore fines and financial stress on the system. And then when we think about managerial capacity, we think about, you know, how is employee training? How is retention? Are you able to keep qualified employees? Maybe, if not, maybe that's reflecting work-life balance and resources available to staff. For small systems, it can be really hard to hire and maintain sufficient staff. So maybe there's some opportunities to collaborate between systems. And we think about, you know, effective communication with external relations as well, right, with constituents, with customers. So there's lots of different components there of managerial, but it's really about kind of the back end background of, how you know, how is the team functioning and how is communication happening? And then there's the financial piece, which maybe is obvious, right? But we're thinking about is, you know, are your revenue sufficient? How is your credit worthiness? Are you able to bring on capital, you know, loans, grants, bonds, that sort of thing? Um, do you have the right controls in place? Are you taking care of depreciation? Are you accounting for it? Are you budgeting well? Are you doing asset management and planning, right? Are you able to look ahead and think about your financials, financials sustainably? You know, and we really take a look at audit data to reveal some of this type of information. So really understanding your numbers 
where they're coming from and where they're going to is really important. All right, so now that we have some understanding of how do you check in on your utility, and we'll dive into financial benchmarking and asset management as well. But you know, there we folks need, you know, you might need to pull in other resources. So we like to talk about different partnerships because being able to have capacity across that technical, managerial, and financial spaces, those different facets, is critical for the sustainability of utility. So if there's gaps, you might be able to identify here's where our gaps are, and maybe there's partnerships that can help fill in those gaps. All right, so these are a few different types of partnerships, and there are lots of different scales and, you know, kind of how you can structure them, and what you get out of it is really determined by what you put into it. And these different examples are going to increase in complexity and formality as we go from left to right. So I'll kind of, we'll start with some of the more basic types and get into the more complex types. So we can start by thinking about agreements and contracts. Um, so, you know, one example is joint contracting for services that can lower prices. Maybe it's bulk chemical purchasing, your chlorine, your flocculants, that type of thing. And you have an agreement and your participation in each bid is optional, right? Maybe you set up some sort of agreement and, hey, this one's of interest. We're using this one. We'd like to participate in that. Um, another option is systems sharing equipment so that each one doesn't have to buy, own, or rent all the equipment they need, right? Maybe it's tapping water pipes, um, you know, and the, the larger system or the one that owns it, you know, pays, they, they send a bill for employee time and travel and use of the equipment. But, you know, then you guys are sharing different, a couple of different utilities are sharing some of those expensive pieces of equipment across them. Um, yeah, another type is really, it's more informal. It's just information sharing. So sometimes we find that there's just even a lack of knowledge of what's going on. So maybe you're, you know, doing workshops or seminars, you're doing conferences, and during breaks, you're doing a more formal meeting or training. Or maybe even you're doing like a monthly meeting for, you have a meal, and you rotate which facility you're at, and you discuss common interests, concerns, challenges you're facing. And maybe you have guest speakers, or you do some trainings, right? There's all sorts of ways to have some of those more informal um just relationships to be able to share some information. So here, here are a few examples of some of those more basic ones, agreements and contracts. In Hendersonville, um, North Carolina, they um, have a system to assist smaller nearby systems with use of equipment. They don't have a formal agreement, but they generally, they'll send an operator with the equipment. Now we tend to recommend some type of agreement so that it's clear, but um, this seems to work for them and it's, they're able to support local smaller systems as well. And this other example here, the Tessagigi Water and Sewer Authority in Western Carolina, um, they have adjacent water intakes and treatment plants. And the Western Carolina University only serves campus. There's no metered customers. And they share equipment in emergency situations we'll actually talk about next. Um, they've talked about some kind of future collaborations, but so far there's nothing formal. So right now it's really just about um, sharing that water. Um, so emergency partnerships are a very common type of partnership and collaboration. We see this quite often. Um, simply put, right, it's working together on emergency planning or providing emergency connections or emergency um, you know, supplies, equipment, that sort of thing. And so typically we see this come up as a form, as like a network that provides utilities with the means to obtain help in the form of personnel, equipment, materials, and associated services quickly from other utilities to restore critical operations impacted during an emergency, right? Whether there's a storm, a fire, you know, whatever the case may be in that emergency, they're able to help out. And typically there are agreements that they set up that clarify just liability and reimbursement processes, response procedures, um, and joint planning efforts. So one example is um, this map here shows interconnections in North Carolina, many of which are just for emergency circumstances. So I live in Durham and work in Chapel Hill, and here's an example, you know, Durham to Chapel Hill, there's a connection. Um, and it's there's a contract in place and it's exclusively for emergencies. So there's no frequent or regular flow between them, but it's a backup in case of emergencies. 
Um, the other thing is that this is a system that's or a, kind of a, a partnership that's really encouraged by the EPA is having these emergency connections. So there's lots of water and wastewater agency response networks called WARNs. Um, and utilities pledge to assist each other in emergencies or natural disasters. And each warrant enters into a mutual aid and assistance agreement that best meets the member system needs. Um, again, those you know agreements clarify the liability and all those different processes and are very much EPA guided. Um, there's you know membership um, available regardless of how you own the system, and you know if you're unable to send resources in an emergency, right? There's not an obligation, so there's lots of different kind of components of this that make it really viable for each utility. And so we've got this short video here that we'll go ahead and play about warns. Warns, water and wastewater agency response networks are intrastate networks of utilities helping utilities during an emergency. With programs across the country, Warns have been successful in responding to a wide variety of incidents, ranging from main breaks and water shortages to earthquakes and other disasters. We can have floods, we can have hurricanes, we can have tornadoes, we can we have wildfires. The most recent activations have been due to low pressure in the system, and those have generally been a result of um, well malfunctions or water main breaks. With more than 25 major activations to date, Warns nationwide facilitate the sharing of equipment and skilled personnel, reducing response time and saving utilities money during emergencies. The salmonella outbreak in Alamosa, Colorado in March and April 2008 was the largest warn activation that state has ever seen. Once the state was notified, within hours, co-warn was activated and crews were deployed to Southern Colorado. And the cleanup effort, um, which was essentially decontamination of the system, flushing of the entire distribution system, and then dechlorinating so that it could be used for, the water could be used again for human consumption, uh, was estimated to take three to four weeks. But because of the co activation, and there were so many resources provided, um, it actually just took 13 days. Although each event is unique, all hazards preparedness measures by utilities and the exercising of warrant operational plans can help streamline response efforts. Another key element to a successful warrant response is communication and coordination with response partners. The relationships with your local and state emergency responders cannot be overstated in times of crisis. Because we have such a large network of utilities, we already have a relationship with uh, the, the uh, uh, emergency operations people, uh, then we're able to respond going both ways with utilities requesting and with the EOC in such a rapid fashion that they understand who we are, what we're doing, and the questions aren't being asked, why are these people getting into this? They're asking us to get into and resolve the problem. With an all-hazards approach, resource sharing, and extensive coordination, forums across the United States are prepared to respond to a wide range of incidents. Help better prepare your community and learn more about WARM by visiting epa.gov slash mutual aid or nationalwarn.org. Great. All right, so the next type of partnership that I'm going to dive into is um, franchising. So um, there can be a kind of sharing and collaborating between different utilities. So maybe a system can share an operator or a contract with the same operator or company. Um, there are kind of more formal purchasing agreements. Um, you know, we've got an example in Iowa. There was a small community that had trouble retaining staff. And so they signed a memorandum of understanding, an MOU with a larger system. They only needed somebody on site for a couple of hours per day because someone could be monitoring remotely as well. And so the larger utility sent their operator for those couple of hours. They got some extra revenue and the smaller utility had access to operators that they really had trouble recruiting. So that's one option you know, for some of those types of operational collaborations as well. And we have one example here in the 
um, Northeast Merrimack Valley Chemical Consortium. Um, there were utilities included from both Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Over 70 of the utilities, they joined together to negotiate chemical and laboratory pricing. So in this case, it was you know, increasing efficiencies with the bulk, bulk pricing um, with a formal relationship. And it's helped streamline purchasing procedures for all of the members. Um, they also did some coordination um, on regulatory requirements with state agencies, shared storage capacity and supplies, um, and provided other networking and information sharing opportunities. And another example here is the Florida Governmental Utility Authority. They formed in 1999 with an interlocal agreement. There's now over 98 systems in 14 counties. And their desire was to really use their common responsibilities to acquire, own, improve, operate, and maintain water and wastewater utilities um, or facilities. And so they provide financial management for 97 water and wastewater utility systems. They've got consolidated executive management and board. And so it really helps them streamline some of those processes and reduce the need for that, that type of process on the smaller systems. All right, so kind of edging more towards the formal imposed districts regionalization. Um, you know, I did mention just, just now here, pooling resources, buying power um, and technical expertise, right? Maybe there's one utility, maybe they're coming together under a regional authority and one utility is in charge of specific types of projects or functions across multiple service areas. Um, you know, and then there's collaboration on workforce development. So systems can maybe form a regional entity either as a separate option or the only option, right? And they've got roles on board, that sort of thing. So there can be some, some, some wiggle room, right? These aren't straightforward options. There's lots of different possibilities under each of these, but there are opportunities to kind of set up some regional networks. All right, so one example here is the Yadkin Valley Sewer Authority. It formed in 2006. It's based here in North Carolina. There's three counties. To make a good cup of coffee, John Cheek says clean water is crucial. When he opened Dirty Joe's Coffee Shop three years ago, the water was a concern. Coming into the location, it was a hair salon. Uh, chemicals, chemicals were kind of harsh. Yeah, I remember that next time I need some help. Right? But Cheek found that the new sewer authority was able to quickly assess and fix the leak and prevented wastewater issues that could have spelled trouble. Had we not had the Yakin Valley Sewer Authority here, it would have been setting in just basically doing it ourselves and having to, to front that money and, and the town having to take care of it. And maybe we would have waited and maybe we feel like not opening it. Before the sewer authority, towns individually managed water treatment and wastewater handling. They decided to join forces because the towns were losing money, making it difficult to maintain and improve local systems. It saves us money by being able to do that, by having, and also the other towns being able to help fund the sewer authority. It, it, it keeps us out of the sewer business, which means we don't have to have the personnel or the benefits that go along with them. For Cheek, he remembers having to rely on wells for his water before the authority was created. He says the authority isn't just a service, but has become an important member of the community. So well water, you know, you you, you have you you don't know if there's chemicals in it, you don't know what's going into your well. And with these guys you do. I mean it's it's pretty nice to, to know that they are looking out for us and keeping our water safe. So in this example, the different systems are all streamlining their wastewater. There's only one discharge site needed, one permit needed, and they're completing projects collaboratively. So the sewer authority takes care of that wastewater treatment for these communities. All right, so thinking about the most, um, you know, the most formal, the most complex, right, is the actual consolidation. And I'm gonna go into, um, into the, this, quite a bit more in depth. So I'm gonna skip examples for now, but this is you know two or more utilities coming together, right? And forming one utility. And I think, you know, we think about, or I tend to think about um, partnerships as a tool for 
for folks who are struggling, um, maybe for some of those like rural areas or places with population decline. But really, it's important to think about these tools um, generally that this could really they could be beneficial for all sorts of different types of systems. And so there's actually one example where there's a lot of growth. And so they were struggling to keep up and set up some partnerships to help address that, right? So it's not a one, one size fits all and not only a tool for one type of situation, right? It's not just, you know, industry loss. It can also be industry gain, right? And learning lessons about new types of industries coming to your area, for example. And, you know, so, so we're gonna dive into a consolidation a little bit. And I do find that towns and utilities can be apprehensive about the word consolidation, even partnerships or regionalization. Um, there's often a lot of concerns about loss of autonomy and the pride that comes with having a community utility and the potential it brings, right? If it's done well, there can be good revenue coming into a community and good economic development and prosperity. And it isn't always the best option. I'll also preface with that. I mean, we're gonna talk it through, but it's not because I think it's the best option for everyone. So, but I'm hoping that you can come in kind of with an open, open perspective in terms of how it could be useful, when it might be useful, um, just to reduce some of that apprehension around the word and what it might look like or mean. All right, so let's talk about what is consolidation. So it's two or more legal distinct entities becoming one. And under the one, they're operating under the same governance, management, and finances. It may or may not include physically interconnecting assets. So I think that's a common misconception that you have to tie all the systems together. That's not necessarily the case. So, but maybe it makes sense. So it's kind of dependent on the situation. And it can just be a utility and not an entire town or jurisdiction. I think that's another common thing thinking, you know, you think about your small town and you're no longer your small town. Well, that's not the case. You can stay your small town and it's just the utility that's consolidating. And I like to think about types of consolidation as I think about fish. So um, so it's a little bit silly, but it helps me understand. So direct acquisition is probably the easiest one to understand. And I think it's probably what most of us think about when we think about consolidation, but it's absorption, right? It's a higher capacity utility acquiring the assets, operations, and customers of another system and absorbing them into their existing governance, operations, financial frameworks, et cetera. Versus the joint merger, which I think about as two fish, having a baby and then dying. So then just that one fish remains and they're relatively equal partners. They have both adjust their governance operations and financial frameworks to create a new entity that's equally owned and controlled. And then there's this kind of more complex one called a balanced merger. And I like to think about it as a school of fish. So there's direct participation by the pre-existing utilities in decision-making, but who has authority and the number of board seats is gonna vary based on who's chipping in what. So rather than kind of these equal partners coming in, maybe the, the blue utility, you know, has 20, 20 fish coming in, 20 asset, you know, asset value coming in. So they get two seats on the board versus the red utility, you know, they're only bringing in 10, so they get one seat on the board, right? So it's about, it's relative to what you're bringing in. All right, so I'm gonna dive into the financial benefits of consolidation. This typically, you know, is one of the main motivators, right? Is that there's financial benefits to it. And there are challenges and we'll go into those as well. But um, I'm gonna run through each of these. I realize there's a lot of text here, but I'm gonna try to run through each of these to make them clear on the different types of benefits. So the first one here is economies of scale and operating efficiencies. So, you know, if you think about meter reading, reading 50 meters per month costs more per meter than reading 50,000 meters, right? Or you think about, you go shopping at Costco to get a better unit, price, right? You think about get a, you get better rates for um, chemicals, chlorine, whatever, bought in bulk. And then you also think about staffing salaries. You've got a highly trained manager. They're probably costing you the same if they're serving 500 customers or 5,000 customers. So being able to benefit, um, you know, from spreading some of those costs, those costs over larger groups of customers and having those economies of scales and efficiencies. 
And then thinking about increased access to capital at lower costs. So we've I've already mentioned that the sector is hard and it's expensive. Um, replacing infrastructure is incredibly expensive. Most of you probably know that. Um, and it requires high investment costs. And we, we actually generally encourage folks to take out loans and grants because it's expensive to maintain. And then you're able to spread out the cost of those over your customers over time. Um, but having access to that capital can be really challenging for small systems, especially if they're not in the habit of accessing those loans. So you can typically get better terms and interest rates on bonds and loans um, if you're in kind of a more um, regional or consolidated system, you're bringing in multiple um, entities. It can also help you qualify for subsidized public funding, right? Thinking about that state revolving fund loan or state planning grants, um, you can save quite a bit on principal costs and interest. There's often a priority for showing, you know, consolidation efforts or partnership or regionalization efforts um, in some in qualifying for some of those. So it can help access, help you access better capital. Um, the other piece, you know, I think a lot of people think about is that kind of lower equal customer rates for a specified level of service. Um, consolidation is often expenses up, expensive up front. It can cost a lot of money. We'll talk a tiny bit about that when we talk about the challenges. So initially, you might need to raise rates to cover the costs of the consolidation. Um, it's possible some customers may see short-term rate reductions, but really the goal and the benefit is rate parity, right? So you think about all of the customers across a certain geographic area that are gonna all be on the same rate structure. And maybe you're able to help buffer and, and slow rate increases across time, over time for those customers. Um, another big one is revenue stability. So if you have a wide variety of types of customers across lots of different geographies, right, your system is less vulnerable to shortfalls um, or to somebody leaving, right? So you're able to mitigate those, those fluctuations and spread the shortfalls over that larger customer base when they do occur, right? So you think about town A and town B, you know, one's relying on it, re relying really heavily on one type of user, but if they leave, it's got a larger impact. Um, you know, if you've got five, you know, five customers who can't afford to pay, well, out of 500, that's quite a bit, but maybe you have five out of 5,000, and then it helps you kind of buffer some of those shortfalls. Um, there can also be reduced exposure to regulatory penalties, so it can be more cost effective if you're working across a larger system to implement the regulatory compliance pieces, right? It's just you're able to, if you need to, you know, hit a certain target um, or put in place a certain policy, it's easier to do that if it's standardized across your entire base rather than each individual utility is and trying to come up with, you know, a plan and implement it themselves. Um, and you can shift some of that regulatory responsibility um, and streamline the, the cost of approvals, right? You're not, each system's not trying to get approvals or permits, that sort of thing. Um, and it can also help provide immediate regulatory financial relief, right? So maybe you're consolidating, one of the systems keeps getting dinged for one type of violation, Well, you can shift some of your available cash, help them reduce that violation or get rid of it completely, which helps kind of save some of those longer term costs. Uh, and then thinking about improved planning and risk management, just generally, there's probably going to be a little bit more time to have a more comprehensive strategy, um, help mitigate risks like diminishing water supply, um, strategizing with industrial polluters, right? Maybe you're able to put in place a plan for these types of industries. Um, you know, it really does, water and wastewater services keep local economies running and communities healthy and the environment safe. And being able to plan for those is going to be a lot more manageable in a larger scale to be able to have staff to dedicate time to doing that. The other piece is, um, is something that might be, might not be as obvious on the books. It's going to be more off the books in the broader community. Um, you know, some communities can, with lack of services, can struggle to keep, grow, or develop their local economies, right? The coffee shop's not going to want to come in if they don't have access to water. Or a brewery is not going to come in if they have no, um, you know, no way to dispose of their wastewater. 
So, you know, it might not be obvious on the utilities budgets and rate sheets or financial documents, but there's benefits to the broader community to be able to boost that economy. All right, so thinking a little bit about some of the challenges and then considerations if you're thinking about consolidation. So challenges, this isn't, consolidation isn't a fail safe way to protect a utility from risks. Um, specifically thinking about like over optimistic projections, right? If you're not being realistic, um, large customer losses, right? That could still be an issue even if you were to consolidate um, or the cost of retrofitting and building resilient systems, right? So there still might be a need for additional funding to kind of get your system up to snuff. Um, and like I mentioned, it might require and probably will require upfront increased costs, um, right? There might be some regulatory requirements and there might be a backlog of infrastructure investment, right? If you've got a utility coming in that hasn't been able to spend, you know, hasn't set aside funding for depreciation and hasn't been able to spend money to upgrade their infrastructure, there might be a backlog, um, and then, like I mentioned before, right, a lot of utilities have a desire for autonomy or a mistrust of other systems. So there's quite a bit to navigate in that space as well. And that's the community at large, not just your governance. The other piece, too, is that a lot of utilities are unaware of other systems or of options for consolidation. So I'm working in one community in South Carolina, and there's an, another nearby utility, and they don't even know where their lines are running. Right. They know that they're nearby, but they don't know where what that looks like. So really, sometimes there's a lack of understanding and sometimes it can be hard to approach and learn more about what's going on. Right. Maybe there's somebody else that's closer and they don't even know it, um, you know, or one utility is struggling to find an operator. But there's a town nearby that's got a great operator who's maybe underutilized. Right. So sometimes it's just lack of knowledge. Um, and typically, there aren't a lot of outside independent forces that are kind of initiating collaboration, right? Sometimes it has to really come from internal, and there has to be a push for it, which can be hard to get jump started if there's not. There are certain states, certain you know areas that are pushing for regionalization, consolidation, um, and it does become a priority area for some of the state revolving funds, that sort of thing. So um, there can be some some external pressures to, to suggest that, but it's not guaranteed. All right, so let's say you're contemplating consolidation. Here are a few considerations that you wanna make sure to think about before you kind of dive in and go down this path. Um, the first is upfront costs, right? So planning, doing the studies, understanding staffing capacity to undertake consolidation, what does it look like afterwards can be expensive. Um, we mentioned the infrastructure improvements, projects, physical connections, if you decide to physically connect, can all be expensive. So it's important to spend some time thinking about what are those costs going to be up front. There's also this issue that financial benefits cannot always be distributed equally, right? So there might be compromise and commitment to solutions to maintain affordability for all customers. The region as a whole might benefit, but individual utilities or individual communities might not benefit the same. So there's going to be, you know, you'll have to have some of those conversations. What does that look like? Is this fair? Is this reasonable? How do we agree to these terms? Um, the savings timeline is important, right? So one of the things with consolidation, right, is the financial benefits, right? That's what we really want to see. Um, but one, there's going to be upfront costs um, and, you know, smoothing those costs by spreading payments out over time can reduce the burden on individual payments. But it might not, those savings might not be as obvious shorter term. And when you're dealing with short political terms, uh, term limits, for example, it might be you might be hard, you know, hard pressed to try to sell it to certain political figures because they don't, you know, they're risking their reelection and they want to see, you know, immediate relief. Um, so it can be really difficult. You know, you're able we can show different models and financial instruments to show those savings over time um, or potentially accelerate those savings. Um, but it's it's going to be more difficult to get everybody on board if you're kind of facing some of those issues. 
Um, the other thing to think about is that a lot of, you know, if you've got utilities coming together, they're probably starting in different places, right, in terms of financially where they're standing. And we're going to talk through financial benchmarks. So that might be, you know, one tool to use to really understand who's coming in from where. Um, but there's going to be efforts required to harmonize rate schedules, right, do that va asset valuation understand savings, liabilities. So there's some time come, you know, that's going to have to be spent coming in to understand where everyone is and how to how do we adjust consolidation because, because of that. Um, and then the last one are, you know, unequal or conflicting incentives. So um, you know, again, regional benefits can be more obvious and maybe help communities with less incentive better understand why consolidation is important for long-term sustainability. But it might be harder to sell a higher capacity utility, um, you know, on the benefits if they don't if they're not as strong for them as they are for maybe the lower capacity utilities. And if not everyone's incentivized, it can really lead to, um, you know, less robust and, and solid relationships. All right. So. Like I said, consolidation is not the right solution for everybody. Um, there can be financial and economic benefits um, outcomes, and but you have to really consider all of the challenges that you might face, both on the kind of logistical piece, but also on the um, you know customer facing the the social piece. Um, some success factors, right, that we've seen are understanding the financial impacts, short term and long term, having patience, um, being able to do that long range planning before kind of diving in, um, having those external incentives is really helpful. And having really strong leadership can really make a difference. And what I haven't even included or touched upon are also, you know, like I said, social impacts within a community or a region. How do people react to it? How do they feel about it? Potential environmental impacts. Um, a little bit on the political drive, right? We mentioned some of the term limits, but, you know, there, there might be some political motivation either direction. Um, so thinking about that and that community response, right? So there's lots of different components to think about if you're considering the consolidation pathway. Um, all right, so despite the numerous considerations and potential challenges to consolidation that I've just mentioned, consolidation can and does happen. And the EFC has produced a number of documents detailing case studies of partnerships, regionalization and consolidation. I'm gonna share a few of the examples here, um, but we have a slew of resources and I'll show that at the end um, that you can look at more case studies more in depth because I'm gonna kind of go through these quickly. Um, so one example here in here in North Carolina in Raleigh. So I've what I've done is I've pulled the different benefits that they were trying to achieve here. In this case, the utility was trying to achieve six of the seven financial benefits that we've identified, but um, some of the other examples will only be a couple of them. And in the case of Raleigh, there were seven utilities that merged into one full service regional water and wastewater provided. Um, the conversation started in the 90s and they were finalized in 2006. So it can also be a lengthy process. And the main driver for Raleigh was actually quick growth and limited water resources. So um, that, you know, they were experiencing really high growth and the higher capacity utility, which was Raleigh, took on ownership and operations of the small and medium sized neighbors around them. And the communities paid Raleigh for improvements to complete the consolidation and those communities chose how that, what that looked like, how that happened. And the communities that did consolidate had cost savings, lower rates and increased water security. Um, and the larger community was also experiencing, you know, support for permitting. There is quite a, a push here in the state for partnerships and collaboration um, and reduced competition for water resources. Um, there was leadership, like I said, that was provided by the county, um, quite a bit of incentive for them. And, you know, there was expedited approvals, permitting because of that, that movement and that incentive. Um, they reduced du duplication. They had a larger customer base, uniform rates. Um, it reduced their O&M costs and capital costs. 
Um, another example is the Hampton Road Sanitation District in Virginia. And these are the three um, goals, you know, the financial benefits that they're really trying to achieve, the economies of scale, um, reduce exposure to penalties, and improve planning and risk management. And in the case of this sanitation district, um, they provide wholesale wastewater treatment to 14 incorporated governments. Um, the sanitation district actually formed in 1940, so it's pretty old. Um, and they, in 2014, just updated and have a MOU to consolidate with another local program. The main driver for them um, was actually, they're located on the Chesapeake Bay. And so they were dealing with pollution entering the bay um, from poor wastewater treatment. And so they were hit, getting hit with high regulatory compliance costs um, and wanted to improve those environmental outcomes. And so they did an incremental consolidation. It wasn't a full merger. And what the sanitation district does is they made improvements to assets and then they provide wholesale treatment. So the distribution system, all the customer engagement interaction all stayed with the local utility, but the sanitation district is treating and discharging the wastewater. And kind of on the opposite side here on the water side, um, Logan Todd Regional Water Commission in Kentucky, um, they were trying to increase access to capital um, and then also economic development. And they were having um, problems with water quality and it was costing them business. Um, so in this case, they had 12 systems create one water treatment facility. Um, in 1995, it was formed. And in 2003, they began serving treated water to the distribution systems. Like I mentioned, you know, water quality concerns and shortages were really a main driver. And that authority, again, those 12 systems retain distribution, but they purchased water wholesale from this authority. And ultimately it did attract new businesses and industry. They were having a hard time retaining businesses because of lack of high water quality. And so um, they were able to bring businesses back in in industry. All right, so talk a little bit about steps for partnering. Um, so if you're gonna go through with partnering, collaborating in any type of form, whether it be consolidation or otherwise, right? There's a lot to think about, which we've already mentioned a little bit. Um, but here are kind of some key actions or decisions. Um, one, assess the feasibility of the options, right? Which one might make sense, might work for you. Uh, value the physical assets of all of the systems involved. Address outstanding obligations and responsibilities. That's gonna vary from utility to utility. Understand the impact on customer rates, what that might look like short-term, long-term. Um, develop governance structures for a governance structure for a consolidated utility, if that's, if you're going the consolidation route. Um, and then same thing on the board representation, right? So what, what would that look like if consolidation is the, the, mo you know, the main direction forward? And then the other thing we like to mention is developing a process to resolve disputes, right? We're all human. It's kind of inevitable that there's going to be disputes at some kind at some point. So what does how do you manage those? What does that process look like? So we like to start with thinking about developing SMART goals, right? SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. And how often you're evaluating those goals is based on the availability of data to measure the goals. And these don't need to be complex, but we just recommend that you set up goals that are measurable so you can kind of see how you're doing. You're able to track that. All right, so thinking about a couple of those different components there. So your systems need to determine how to focus their efforts, resources, activities, time, et cetera, to best address competing priorities. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth about asset management. And the assets themselves are often the most valuable thing a government owns. So it's really important to define and value them during a consolidation or during collaboration. And determining who maintains and owns, you know, given parts of the system's assets will provide accountability and billing for services as well. Right. So a few things to think about, right, are book value, cash flow value, arranging engineering, facilitation, planning assistance, transparent analysis, and potential future scenarios, meter maintenance, and ownership responsibilities. So there's a few kind of components, and we'll dive into asset management, excuse me. 
Um, clarifying language is really important, right? So um, defining we, what are the service areas, who's included in that, um, who can serve unserved areas, what do the decentralized users look like, or how do we bring them in? How do we change, expand service areas in the future? And what are the costs associated with those changes and how would that affect rates? So really spending some time to think about what that might look like. And addressing outstanding obligations and responsibilities. So debt, staffing consideration, um, how can debt be covered if there's no longer revenue um, you know, being generated to cover that debt? And then what about staffing losses for small systems? How do you harmonize that? And you know, it's important because it prevents unwanted surprises. And, you know, impact on customer rates, the lower rates aren't a guarantee, right? So you do need to do some analysis to understand what the rates might look like, um, especially if rates are low for too many people. You know, if you haven't done raise, uh, haven't raised rates in a little while. Um, are there some surcharges, maybe some temporary increases? And then how can rates among consolidated utilities ultimately be equalized, right? That's kind of a long-term goal, that parity. And it's important because this is often the biggest concern for the customer, right? Rightfully so. What am I going to be paying? And governance structure. Um, so this is going to depend on a lot of different factors. You know, the number of utilities combining, um, the service area, anticipated growth or decline, really understanding your demographics the existing financial health of systems and future regulatory costs, right? So the governance is gonna impact every component of your service provision. So really setting up a, a solid framework for what does that look like is really important. And then thinking about the board representation, right? Who's making the decisions? What does that look like? How many seats are there? How are we assigning them? Why are we assigning them in that way? Um, is every does everyone have a seat at the board? Why or why not? Right? How do we um, how do we do those processes? How do we approve new rates? How do we approve you know procurement or or other relationships? Um, how can you know how can we change or modify the board if the future you know structure really demands it? All right, and then resolving disputes. I'm not going to really dive into this. Typically, though, you know, local governments opt for binding arbitration, but it can be limiting um, since it prevents appealing decisions and precludes formal litigation, which may end up being necessary. So contracting entities may prefer non-binding mediation um, since the option of formal litigation is still available. So some disagreements are inevitable, so it's best to try to prepare for them in the way that's best for your utility or the agreement you guys are putting together. All right, so here are some of the resources that we have that are specific to partnering, collaboration, consolidation. These are all on our website. Um, and so I'll leave this up for just a beat here so you can see it and, and we'll share the deck as well. So you'll be able to pick it up there. You can also just search for it on our website, efc.sog.unc.edu um, and you can search for regional things as well. Great, so now that we've taken some time to talk about partnering and some of those options, consolidation, key considerations, one of those considerations is financial, understanding your system's finances before you start to dive forward. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to know your system based on, um, you know, based on some of those financial benchmarks. And we do former, we do longer format trainings on some of these components. So I'm going to go through them briefly, but there are additional resources that we have um, if you're interested in diving deeper into some of these pieces. We'll also talk about asset management. Um, and both of these two things, you know, combine are critical pieces of understanding your system's TMF capacity. All right. So financial benchmarks. What are financial benchmarks? They are those quantifiable measures of performance. So we can measure them. And they're things that people care about, right? If you know a loan lender is gonna care about them, um, your customers should theoretically care about them and having the data is helpful. So they can really give us a holistic picture of utility performance and needs and help set future goals and understand growth. Um, they can also inform capital planning, understand your affordability and some of your financing options. 
And um, like I say, kind of measuring some of the progress, assess your operational performance um, and, you know, being able to set those goals, like I said, and they in, do have impacts on um, your investment capacity and just your general financial health. So we often will take time and review these with like a town, a town council or um, the governance, the board structure as well, because they care about what the town is, is looking like financially. Um, so I mentioned these things already, right? Holistic picture, setting future goals, informing capital planning, affordability and financing. Okay, so what are the different ones that we're going to go through? We're going to go through operating ratio, which basically is asking or addressing, is your system self-sufficient? Can it operate within its own terms? Um, asset depreciation, how much of utilities um, expected life has already run out and how much is left? Um, your debt service coverage ratio. So are you able to cover your debt service after paying for your day-to-day -day operations? Do you have money left over to cover that debt? Days cash on hand. Let's say your customers stop paying their bills. How long could you maintain? How long could you function as a utility? And then your quick current ratio, which is a snapshot of can your system meet its short-term obligations right now? So we'll go through each of these. We'll start with the operating ratio. It's the most common um, and it's present on the dashboards that the EFC puts together. Um, and so what it is, like I said, is a measure of self-sufficiency. Can you, can you function independently? Um, so it's the revenue that you get from your daily operations divided by the expenditures or expenses you make to keep operations running. It's a pretty simple calculation, revenues over expenses. You want it to be bigger than one. Um, you know, when you're looking at your audit, it's typically your enterprise funds that your water and sewer are falling under. So it's looking at just those, not the entire, um, not your entire town. And um, the, the revenue can include your rates, your late fees, your penalties, connection fees, tap fees, any of those related kind of sources of income. Um, it's all the charges that you charge your customer that go into those revenues. And your operating expenses include all the expenses you have um, for O&M, for operations and maintenance, supplies, salaries, benefits, overtime, taxes, insurance, all those types of things. Um, and they are those all of those are included. Um, it does also include depreciation. There is a way you can measure the operating ratio excluding depreciation, but we highly discourage that. Um, you want to be able to cover your expenses and be able to set aside money for depreciation. Um, so we'll we'll look at both of those things. Um, so, and like I said, if you are over one, then that means that your revenues are exceeding your expenses. And so that's why our goal is over one. Um, I already went through all of these things here of what, what's included on all of your um, operating revenues and expenses. All right. So thinking a little bit about depreciation, we'll talk about this briefly now because it's important not only in asset management and thinking about when you're where how you're coming into a potential partnership opportunity, um, but it's also really important for the operating ratio. So depreciation is actually just an accounting solution for the physical problem of aging infrastructure. Right. It's setting aside those funds that cost of your, you know, of every year for your infrastructure wearing out. It's a percentage of its value. So it's not, um, you're not buying the thing, but you're trying to set aside that money. Um, and so let's see here. Um, what, so what is it? What is it? What does it look like? A lot of you guys are familiar with this, I'm sure, but depreciation is loss of value over time of an asset that's not restored by current maintenance, right? So, uh, you know, if you're running a utility, you're likely to have components of your utility that are depreciating, even something like a computer, right? It's losing its value. It's depreciating. Um, it's just an economic way of determining that cost. Um, and it's, a value loss for both declining physical factors and um, functional or non-physical factors. So if, so obsolescence is an example, let's say a piece of equipment just doesn't work, like it's gonna be replaced with something alternative, right? So obsolescence can be part of depreciation. And this is what not budgeting for depreciation looks like. 
um, you know, infrastructure wear, wears out over time. And if there's no money in your fund to pay to replace those assets, your assets are going to fail, um, you know, and you won't be able to provide your service anymore. So not budgeting for the depreciation or for comprehensive capital investments, um, you know, you won't be able to balance, you, you might be able to balance the budget, but not long term, your assets won't last forever. And it'll be expensive to fix on short notice with no reserves to pay for that infrastructure. All right, some of the causes of depreciation, depreciation typical, just standard wear and tear from use, um, decay, rot, rust, corrosion, right? We're working in systems that have those elements. Um, and it's, you know, related to the extent of regular maintenance, right? So you're going to slow down depreciation if you're completing regular maintenance um, versus the opposite. Um, Non-physical factors, I mentioned obsolescence, right? New designs, innovations, improvements. Um, inadequacy to meet current demand, right? Maybe your system's ex expanding and um, or changes in regulation if it's not sufficient to hit some of those needs. A super, super straight line depreciation example, let's say your purchase price is $10,000 for this hydro pneumatic tank. Its useful life is 10 years. So your annual depreciation is $1,000. This is a very simplified version of it, but it helps you at least understand. So then over those 10 years, you'll set aside a thousand. And by the end of the 10 years, you'll be able to replace the hydro pneumatic tank because you will have put aside 10 grand for it. So if your utility is budgeting for future expenses and you have a capital improvement plan and you know well what your comprehensive needs are, are going forward, then you should be able to budget O&M and all of the capital investments you're expecting to be paying for. So you have to budget for all of those pieces. Um, there are many different ways to, to calculate depreciation. I'm not going to dive into those, but there are lots of resources out there for how to do it. Um, being able to just kind of set aside cash is, is better than um, nothing, but we do recommend asset management and capital planning. Um, all right, we'll do one quick example of operating ratio before we move on. Um, so we see here total operating, this is for Mayberry, total operating revenue here, a 444. And depreciation, they are we are going to include that, 142, and their operating expenses of 511. So their operating expenses for, for, for revenue is 444. Their operating expenses, so we're going to exclude depreciation, show you the difference between this calculation. They're going to take away that 142 for depreciation, leaving a total operating expenses of 369. And so their ratio is over 1, 1 1.2. But we don't recommend this because now they're not genuinely kind of setting aside those funds. And so if you just do the operating expenses, including the depreciation, their ratio is only 0.87. So they would need to increase their revenues or reduce their operating expenses to get to one in order to account for that depreciation. And like I mentioned, there's lots of different ways to calculate through them. Um, so one is the historical value. What did you pay for the asset? And if you don't have any other information except for the historical costs, then that's helpful, um, tends not to be the best best measure metric because, you know, chain costs change over time. So the current value, right, if you were going to sell it today to somebody, what would the current value be um, of the asset? And so that's one way to determine the depreciation value. Um, but probably more accurate is the replacement value, right? So if you needed to replace it today, what is that going to cost you and making sure you're budgeting for that that replacement value. All right, and so we do have a metric called asset depreciation. So um, it's a measure of your total assets, how much of your total assets have already depreciated. So as you approach one, your system is near the end of its expected life. So it's your accumulated depreciation divided by your gross plant and equipment, your total costs. Um, and again, this is only as good as your depreciation schedule, right? Depreciation is really an accounting term. So if you're not doing well on the accounting side, then this isn't this value doesn't hold much weight. Um, so um, you know, and, and then thinking about what sorry, I'm just um trying to use this, you know, so you're using this 
to get an assessment of your overall assets. Are they depreciating faster than what you're able to invest in or rehab or recover um, or, you know, slower? Are you doing okay? Um, so, so we're trying to stay, you know, between zero and a hundred, right? But really trying not to get up to, you know, is 34% good, 40% good that have depreciated? It's kind of going to be subjective to your utility and how much you're setting aside and how many reserves you have. All right, so the next, next metric we'll take a look at is the debt service coverage ratio. Um, so this is one of those that, um, that you need to be able to generate enough revenue in a year to pay for your O&M and principal and interest payments. Now, some utilities don't have debt, so you can kind of ignore this one, but the vast majority have some type of debt. And you want your revenue every year to exceed this total, you know, your total sum of your debt both the principal and interest. And this met metric is calculated by funders and debtors. It's a very common metric in the finance world. Um, and so you do, in this case, you do take out depreciation um, and then you divide it by the principal and interest payment. So you need to have enough um, to be able to cover your O&M and principal and interest, like I mentioned. Um, so it's a measure of the ability, your operating revenue um, left after you've you know covered your expenses and your debt service. And like I said, it's it's used very commonly. So our goal here is to be greater than 1.2. And I'll um, show you this example here, Mayberry. So you can see here their principal paid on capital debt at 49 grand and their interest paid on capital debt at 35,000. Sometimes they're combined lines in an audit, but they can be separate lines as well. So we know these numbers from the previous um, slide, their operating expenses of 444. In this case, we do want to exclude depreciation. So 511 minus 142. And then the sum of their principal and interest long-term is going to give them 84,000. So their coverage ratio is 0.89. So you might think that that getting close to one is a good target, um, but you really want a little bit higher of a ratio, 1.1, 1.2, because funders want to see that you have enough security, you know, enough revenue to not just pay for principal and interest, but, you know, to be able to pay for future years where maybe you might have a reduced revenue. So there might actually be covenants um, or requirements that you have numbers that you have to achieve for this value, but we want them to be closer, you know, to 1.1, 1.2. All right, days cash on hand gives you an idea of how long you can continue to pay OM without any additional revenues coming in, right? So let's say everybody stopped paying, or maybe there was a moratorium on bills during a pandemic, for example, um, you know, then this is important to know. And to calculate cash on hand, you need to know what your unrestricted cash and cash equivalents are. That's another line item in your audit. And, and this is basically money that can be used for anything. It's not earmarked or restricted to certain types of um, funds. And then you'd multiply it by a number of days in a year and divide it by your expenses minus your depreciation. Um, there, there are times when there's a cap um, reserve fund that you can't have over a certain amount. Um, you know, so you might have to look into that for your own utility. But our goal here is over 180 days. So that would be, you know, enough. It gives you some buffer to kind of get back on track if need be. So in this case, you can look and see there is a restricted cash item line item, but there's also just a plain, just straight cash, right? So that's the number we're gonna be looking at, 107, and your net receivables of 41, which is also gonna be part of that cash that's not earmarked or restricted for something. So we have that unrestricted cash of 107, that number that we keep pulling back in, those operating expenses, excluding depreciation, um, that's just what it costs, right? Divided by 365. You could also do, you know, flip around the 365 here, but they've got 107 days of um, operations just from your reserves, right? So, and and we say 180 days, but it's really going to be utility dependent. So there's no specific target that suits everyone's needs. 
But again, kind of thinking about COVID, some utilities, you know, had a re revenue reduction from businesses shutting down, um, delinquencies piling up, et cetera, right? So being able to have some buffer is really important. All right, so the quick and current ratio. So this is a snapshot or just sometimes it's just called current ratio. It helps you answer the question, if you do you have enough cash or liquidity to pay for all of your liabilities today? So what you do is you calculate, um, to calculate it, you need your current assets and divided by your current liabilities. And these are all things, again, from your audit and the statement of net position. And in addition to unrestricted cash, you have some other things too that are current or that you could also calculate assets um, to, you know, to, to calculate that quickly. They should be unrestricted, again, not earmarked. So you have immediate access to them. Um, and you want it to be above one, right? You want to be able to pay your bills if you had to. And this, um, this calculation would change daily, right? Based on your liabilities and your assets. Those are going to be really variable at any given time. So this is one that we recommend you, you know, you calculate with some frequency and not just once a year. So to do that calculation here, um, that unrestricted cash and cash equivalents plus the net receivables, and then divided by the current um, liabilities is going to give, in this case, um, 1.38. And like I said, it changes daily. So the ratio changes daily um, and it's just a snapshot in time. All right, so we do have a financial health checkup tool here with the EFC. Um, we generally put in five years of financial audits. It is a publicly available free tool if you wanted to put in your own numbers to do these calculations and kind of see how you're doing. Um, so we use it as a way to say like, okay, how are, you know, are we doing okay? Are, you know, if not, what needs to change? Or if we are, are there still things that we could really work on? Um, and we're also happy to help kind of walk you through this tool if that's, um, if, if, if that's of interest. All right, so the other piece that I'm just gonna delve into a little bit here is asset management. So um, as you're thinking about partnering, consolidating, um, knowing where your assets are is really important. So if this isn't an activity that you've done, um, it's a good idea to go ahead and go through this process. And, you know, so it's really a way to determine how to focus your efforts, resources, activities, time, or, you know, or maybe where you want to partner, how you need to partner um, to address your competing priorities. All of these systems, you know, towns, utilities have competing priorities. So we think about community decision making, right? So, you know, how many of you watching this would choose, you know, the municipal building upgrades versus the bridge rehabilitation and the new park and playground, right? What, you know, and, and everyone's choice of why that, why you'd make those decisions is, di is different, right? Maybe it's the municipal upgrades because they're cheaper and they're gonna have more of an impact. Maybe it's bridge, but maybe there's only, you know, two people that live on the other side of the bridge, right? So there's going to be a lot of competing priorities. Maybe you're trying to encourage families to move your, to your community. So you're prioritizing the park and playground. And the same thing goes for utilities, right? So in this case, what would you do, right? You need to replace, rehab your storage tank. You've got pipe replacement, intake structure repairs, and filter rehab. Maybe you also have a meter project. Maybe you're a, you know, a flat rate, you don't have any metering. And so do you prioritize what's going to bring in revenue? Or do you prioritize, you know, the pipe replacement, which is leaking and costing you money um, because of inflow and infiltration, right? So it's hard to know. It's hard to make a decision, though, without knowing more about what are the priorities and what do each of these things, you know, need, mean, why are they important? So when we think about each of those different assets, these are the types of factors or questions that are useful to ask while you're thinking about those decisions. What needs work? What are the benefits of the different projects? And what are the risks of not doing the project, right? Is it, you know, that something could break tomorrow if you don't do the project versus, well, it still will take another five years for it to break, for example. Does it make sense to do the project now? Are there opportunities in the future that make more sense? Um, what do the customers really want, right? What's their priority? Is there financing available for the project? Um, does the project meet a critical need? 
What's the best expenditure of funds? Um, are there alternatives? What are they? And how will the project affect rates? Can the customers afford any rate changes? Right, so these are some of those important questions to think about. So what is asset management? I've talked about it a few times now, really, but it's a process to make those management decisions easier, right? You've got four projects. How do we prioritize them? It helps your governing body, you know, whoever's making those decisions, decide how and where to spend the money to achieve the desired results, right? The optimal results. And some of the benefits of asset management is you get to know your system a little bit better, which is always good. Um, and it's, you know, identifying how your sister can, your system can improve emergency response. Um, it can also help you improve planning of operations as opposed to being reactionary. How do you plan ahead and say, okay, we need to be able to do this in the next X years. Um, also it can help increase transparency with customers, which they appreciate, which often gets increased support for you, um, help you make better financial decisions and increase your confidence and rates, right? This makes sense um, based on what our needs are, or maybe it doesn't, and we need to talk about what that looks like. All right, there's a lot of text here. I'm not. I'm gonna go through each of these individually, but I'm just gonna show you here the core components of asset management. So it's the assets themselves, the service level, funding, criticality, and life cycle. So I'm gonna go through each of these here. So assets, the condition of an asset can range from excellent, brand new, right, to poor, an asset that's about to fail. And that's likely something you're gonna have to do actually by going out into the field to evaluate something. Um, it can be helpful to record sizes, model numbers, warranty information, manufacturing, maintenance records, operational status, all those different pieces, right? But when we think about the different assets, the physical pieces, what are they? Where are they, right? Getting maps in. What condition are they in? What's their useful life? How much longer do they have? Um, how much are they worth? And what is their energy use is another big one too, right? That kind of um, it compounds. And often, um, you know, one of the best structures for the asset inventory, if possible, is some type of hierarchy structure so you can really visibly see what's going on. So in this type of structure, it's a water system. You know, they're all connected to each other so that the cost and other information can all be rolled up. Um, for example, you know, the chlorination system can be a parent asset and the sub assets could be a chlorine tank and a chlorine pup pump, those types of different things. And that will help you better understand all of your components together collectively. All right, so another component is the service level. So um, what level of service do you want to provide for your customers? How will you measure that performance? So it's, you know, really thinking about policies, goals, and procedures for your organization and get, getting everyone onto the same page. And it's also a chance to have a conversation with customers. What's really important to them? Um, what matters? What, what impacts them most greatly? And how do you measure that? How do you present that to them? Funding. We just talked, you know, through financial benchmarks, but thinking about, you know, do you have the money to provide the capital you need for O&M and for replacement, energy efficiency improvements, essentially, you know, et cetera, right? So thinking about those day-to-day -day expenses, your long-term expenses, you know, funding is needed for all of those pieces. And eventually all of your assets will need to be replaced, right? So how are you setting aside funds for those different pieces that will need to be replaced or are there external funding opportunities, grants, loans, bonds, special funds, right? To be able to fund some of those bigger expenses. Um, and are you investing enough in asset replacement? How do you know? Do you have enough money to address all the operation and maintenance needs? This is why, you know, having that asset management is helpful to understand. And then thinking about criticality, um, this is a big one. So what is the overall business risk based on the probability and consequences of asset failure? Is there redundancy to reduce risk, right? Not all assets are equal in importance to utility. So some are very important to operations and some less so, right? As an example, like a small water wastewater pipe that serves a few households may not be as important to a utility as a single pump that supplies the entire water system, right? If the single pump fails, the whole town is out of water. 
it's important for each utility to determine what its critical assets are. And so the two components of criticality are the likelihood that a given asset will fail, and then the consequences of the, if the asset does fail. So the types of consideration that go into the determination of failure, right, are ways in which the asset can fail, right? How, how could it fail? The condition of the assets, the age, the repair history, historical knowledge, all those pieces that you collected in that asset in that first one, right? What are the physical assets? And then the second component is the consequence of failure, right? So, you know, what the cost of repair might be, social impacts or costs associated with the failure, related to collateral damage, maybe, um, legal costs, environmental costs, reduction in level of services. Um, you know, any other costs or impacts associated with a failure. And one way to reduce the consequences is through redundancy. So if you have redundant assets, if one asset fails and the other one is there to fill in, you know, then, then maybe you're okay. So in this manner, the consequences are reduced because a failure is not one of the assets. The failure of one of the assets will not cause a substantial problem, right? As an example, you've got three pumps available. You only need two to meet demand. If one fails, the standby pump is there, so your demand will be met while you repair the other one, right? So, and, and kind of thinking again about the about your um, your system here, right? This image. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, you know, you've got a connection connections to single households, right? If you've got one. Um, you know, if you've got a break on these three lines to homes, what's that look like versus a break that's on a line to a school or a hospital? How do you rank the school and the hospital? You know, consider the probability of failure in conjunction with the consequence of failure. Low, moderate, you know, low risk, moderate risk, high risk. You know, if you're considering a well's criticality, you might consider the physical factors, you know, age, condition, likelihood of clogging, aesthetic water concerns, depth, et cetera, right? And then you think about the consequences. Well, if it's a deeper one, maybe it's more expensive to repair. Or is it, you know, the number of customers served on it? Um, maybe that's one of the, you know, bigger consequences, right? So thinking about those components. And it's not static, right? So this should be evaluated at least annually and it will change with major changes to your components. If you do upgrades, replacements, construction, right? That's gonna change your criticality of your assets. All right, and then the last one here is the life cycle. Um, is there, you know, the useful life of the assets is the time from when the asset's installed until the asset is no longer able to perform for the utility. And this amount of time should reflect the real world experience of the utility whenever possible. Um, you know, if, if there's no other information, you can use estimates for different types of assets. Um, but what you do on a day-to-day -day basis to your assets to keep them in operation as long as possible is important, right? Because there's this curve, but maybe you're doing some rehab, you're doing some upgrades, and that helps extend that life cycle of your asset. How, so it helps you understand, you know, when and how to replace assets and understand the benefits of the maintenance, right? If it extends its life by a certain amount of time. Um, and also the cost, right? Maybe it's three to four more times, three to four times more expensive to operate without the proper maintenance. Um, you know, maintenance is, is kind of a common item to cut from the budget, but can be really important. And so some of the questions, right, we like to think about and address in the life cycle component is, is there a strategic plan for operating and maintaining your system assets? Um, is a process based on risk in place to determine when to repair, rehab, or replace assets? And are you considering energy efficiency? And so, you know, typically this type of chart can help you visualize how you decide when and, and how to replace your assets. So once your assets condition or functionality starts declining rapidly toward that minimum acceptable service level, then it's time to start maintenance and or replacements. Um, you might be able to extend, like I said, you might be able to extend that life by planning ahead and executing refurbishment. You know, once your asset gets to that minimum acceptable service level, you have to make a decision about what to do. Do you repair it, replace it, rehab it? And if you, and you really don't want to find that out, you know, you don't want to find out that an asset isn't meeting its acceptable service limit by failure, right? You want to know ahead of time 
you, know, you don't want to be working reactively. You want to plan ahead or worst case, right? It completely fails because you've not been tracking it. And these are a few questions that we typically try to ask, um, you know, about each of those assets to help you evaluate, you know, how to incorporate maintenance into your planning. So what maintenance activities do you do? When do you do them? How do you do them? What do they cost and what impact do they have? Okay, so that's really um, a very small overview of asset management and financial benchmarking. Um, like I mentioned, we do more in-depth trainings on both of those components, um, as well as some other things as well. So you're welcome to reach out for additional resources from us. Um, but so bringing it back all together, right? Systems need to determine how to focus their efforts and resources to best address competing priorities. And we know that it is hard to successfully run a small utility. There's no denying that. Um, every utility is unique and you've got to do that holistic check-in on what are the needs and what is realistic. Partnerships at any level can be beneficial, right? Be, you know, from really simple, informal to more complex and formal. And what type of partnership is going to vary based on your needs, right? So doing, taking some of those steps to understand your needs, what, you know, where, where are you on the technical side, the managerial side, the financial side, you know, and being smart when entering partnerships, walk through those key considerations, make sure you've got clear language, measurable goals, all of those pieces so that all parties are benefiting and incentivized and incentivized. And if you're thinking about a more formal partnership, consider going through financial benchmarking and asset management activities. Or if you're not and you just want to know your system a little better, we also recommend that. And utilize the resources. I'm going to pull them up here again. You know, we have a number of them on our website. So um, please, um, you know, please take a look at them. And we will do a follow-up live stream question and answer session on separate September 28th at 12 p.m. Pacific. Um, I've got this link here, and you're also, you should be able to find it where you found this resource as well. Um, so again, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or join us on that September 28th session and um, find some of our resources online on our website. Thank you so much for joining us today.